it's good to be back with you on another Wednesday night. Here is our Bible study. And may the Lord bless us together as we enter into the Word of God for these brief moments. Our scripture is found in Genesis 10, verses 18, 8 to 10. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And Eric, and Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar. Our subject today is Nimrod, God of War. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we ask your blessing upon this, the word of God that we bring to your people. To thee be the glory. To thee be all the praise. We lift you up, Father. We exalt and adore you. We magnify you by our words, by our lives, by everything we do and say. May you be glorified, Father. We humble ourselves in your presence that we may be used of, of you as sons and servants of the living God, captives to the word of God. In Jesus' name we ask it, amen and amen. Praise God, hallelujah. Now, Nimrod, God of war. Uh, in doing this teaching, we must touch briefly on history. Uh, and we must, must touch in particular on the history of Nimrod himself. The origins of polytheism, the belief in many gods, and the origins of Maryolatry, uh, like you would say idolatry, Maryolatry. And we will touch on the origins of ancestor worship. Ancestor worship. Now, the Ninus of history is the Nimrod mentioned in the Bible, Genesis chapter 10. Now, one Pompeius speaks. Now, Ninus, king of Assyria, quoting from history, Pompeius speaking. Ninus, king of Assyria, changed the ancient moderate ways of life by a desire for conquest or war. He was the first who carried war against his neighbors. Of course, the first person for war was Satan in heaven. And now he's found some of his lineage on the earth. One Nimrod, whom he is going to use, and will be the first and is the first to start war and conquests of war on the earth. Now, there it is. He conquered all nations from Assyria to Libya. As these men, for these men, Pompeius speaking, he conquered for these men 
knew not the arts of war. You see, he attacked nations <clears throat> who did not know how to organize. They did not know how to arm themselves with all manner of uh, knowledge of warfare. Uh, but uh, so they were at a disadvantage and he attacked them and was able to conquer them. Another historian speaking, Diodorus. Ninus was the most ancient of Assyrian kings mentioned in history. Being of a warlike disposition, he trained young men rigorously in the arts of war. He brought Babylonia under him. While yet there was no city of Babylon. You see, now this Nina started out to be great. Uh, see, he started out to be great. Now, he built the city, the, the ba Babel, Babylon or Babel. He's the one who built that city. To that extent. And you see, he became great and became its king. Genesis 10, speaking of Nimrod, in the beginning of his kingdom, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Okay, now we found out certain things here. Nimrod developed arts of war or strategies of war. Now, recognize this that we know in history there are others like um, Sun Tzu, the Chinese general, great a man who wrote a great a book on the art and strategy of war. But the originator of all warfare, all strategies, and later on we will find out he started to invent evil things or weapons of war back then. And you will understand what, why. For the Bible calls him that he was a mighty hunter, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now watch carefully. Now, I believe that Nimrod gathered his arts of war from Satan who inspired him. And the inspiration might have gone along these lines. Oh, uh, Nimrod, you are the most skilled hunter on the earth. You know the strategies and the ways uh, of animals, how to trap them, how to find them, how to kill them. Uh, you know the ways uh, uh, to do that. And then the devil switched his thoughts. Think of it, Nimrod. If you can capture animals in their dens, if you can kill them by hunting them, don't you see? If you hunt men, you will be just as successful. I will make you a successful man. If you will hunt men, and the thought seemed to make sense to Nimrod. Because he knows the strategies already. All he has to do is switch it over into the hunting of men. So he began to apply all the principles and knowledge that he had from hunting and turned it towards hunting men through his arts of war. And that is how he became a god of war, or the god of war upon the earth, because later he was worshipped as a god. 
And that is the reason why I took this as a topic. Nimrod, God of War. And he is the originator. He is the evil inventor and creator of war. He was the first to ever gather multitudes of young men and begin to bring them like an army. He formed the first army and disciplined them by, it said, by drilling. He started drilling and going through parades, practice of various uh, ways of defense and attack, uh, various arts of war. And there, through his drilling, uh, his training, he instilled discipline and began to form squads and troops. Later on, as you know, we have battalions and so on. But he started all of that and started that uniformity and militarism, the spirit of war that dropped from heaven, from Satan, inspired man of the earth, and he then took that kind of evil inspiration and began to use it for his benefit to enrich himself, to empower himself, to elevate himself to godhood where he could have man following him and worshiping him. There he is, Nimrod, god of war. Of course, Babel was not yet a city. Babylon was not yet a city, and from Babel he built the kingdom of Babylon and later became king of Babylon. Now we realize Nimrod was the son of Cush, who was the son of Ham. And there in Egyptian culture, Bel is called Hermes. And Hermes is Cush. Let me go back over that. In Egyptian culture, Bel is called Hermes. And Hermes is Cush. And the Bible tells us that Cush begot Nimrod. Now, Hermes means son of Ham. And Cush was the son of Ham. Now, according to further history, Hermes was called that which means son of Ham. He was the ancient prophet of idolatry. He began to insert or uh, instill the practice of idolatry on the face of the earth. For before that time, there was the knowledge of only one God. One eternal self-existing being called God the eternal Elohim. And so he was with the spirit of rebellion, broke away from the things of God, and began to teach the people differently that there is not just one God. There is many gods. And these three are the most premium or prominent gods that you should worship. And so he instilled idolatry. And from that, it produced the doctrine that we know today as the doctrine of the Trinity. And all forms of satanic worship that flowed from that. Now, the Hermes is interesting. You see, 
after God confused the languages of men at Babel, Hermes, or Cush, the father of Nimrod, made it his great effort to unite those languages in rebellion to God. He told the people how he could, he, he could unite their languages, cause them to understand each other, uh, right? And, and when they understand each other, they can continue their building of this great Babel right to the sky, regardless of what Elohim said to them. And there we understand that in fact was a cunning attempt of Satan working through Cush to uh, get the people to rebel against God and the way of God. God divided their tongues, and now he is telling them it's a good thing, like he told Eve, it's a good thing if I can unite you so you can understand each other and we can bring you into a unity. But it's a false made unity which is not of God. This is what is happening to the denominations. This is the great division of tongues. God caused, allowed that to happen, but he now, in our modern age, is forming a world council of churches, and his attempt is to unite the tongues, unite the nations, unite these demon nations, and get them to speak or say the same language. In other words, we will put one doctrinal statement and everybody will have to ascribe to that statement and therefore we will be speaking as one. Of course, they're not saying they will not stand for anyone else to disagree and tell them that's not the truth. The truth is there is one God and his name is Jesus Christ, same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. We know, friends, God started one original church, one original faith. And as in Genesis, so is it in the New Testament, that one original church was divided up into nations denominations, and cause religious chaos and confusion for every one of those denominations are speaking different tongues, different languages, different doctrine, different teachings, contrary to each other. But now he is telling them, he is going to bring them into a unity. He's going to use the World Council of Churches to do that. You see, he unites them by discipline, by uh, throwing into jail all those who will not say what he is saying, what he is teaching. See, God unites by the revelation of his word. Satan unites by his discipline and rigor and false sense of unity arising from his denominationalism. Yes, my friends, and he does it just like Nimrod did by denominational discipline. I remember many years ago as a young uh, man uh, it, getting into a denomination and hearing them saying, don't you mix and mingle with those other churches out there, uh, or don't you speak to them, don't you this and don't you that, but God's hand was upon my life already, and so I didn't care about that. I was friendly with everybody, but when it came to what I believed, I told them what I believe, and some turned away from me, and others, still good friends of mine, but they know what I stand for, and I'm not pulling any punches. I tell them what's the truth, 
And praise God, there's a way you can tell people the truth with love. Paul said, speak the truth in love. You don't have to be obnoxious and overbearing. Amen. We can disagree. But you don't have to be disagreeable. You just have to have the love of God in your hearts and realize that the people in themselves, they themselves have been led astray by these teachings of man contrary to the word of God. Yes. So they give them religious training, training for baptism, training for uh, uh, confirmation, training for this and training for that, discipline for this and discipline for that, drilling this and drilling you into Bible verses and drilling, 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 drilling all the time until everybody becomes into a uniformity and saying the same thing. Amen. Listen, my friends. One God and the true prophets will say the same thing. But they're saying it not because it was drilled into them, but they receive it by revelation from the presence of God. And because God cannot change his word, his first revelation is the original revelation founded in the word of God. Amen. So we find out Hermes, who history also calls Mercury, Bel. And he was also called uh, uh, Janus. These are all names of, of the one person. See, Cush, who had these names in various uh, cultures like that. And so he introduced himself. Of Hermes also means interpreter of the gods or interpreter of the words of God. So he introduced himself that he is going to in, interpret God's word for the people. Bel now, which is Cush, the father of Nimrod, was the ringleader that led the people away from the true God and encouraged the people to see him as the interpreter of the gods. He is the one who encouraged them to go ahead with the building of the Tower of Babel and initiated all of that building, but his son was the one that actually built the city of Babylon. He also encouraged the confusion and the vision of men at first. So Hermes meaning confuser and interpreter. So on one hand, he seems to interpret. On the other hand, he seems to be confusing. This is very much from which the word came called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, which is something I studied while in the denominational uh, college. Yes, that is what they're teaching to this day in the religious universities and colleges, hermeneutics, teaching men how to be interpreters. Right. And you see, my friends, God is his own interpreter. He will make the word of God plain and clear to you. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Praise God. May this study from history and uh, the facts that we are seeing make sense to you and lay a foundation for what next we will be studying in the future. Now, friends. This is what the theologians of today are uh, presenting themselves as. That they are the interpreters of the word. And uh, if they can interpret any which way they want to interpret it. But God's word does not change. It remains the same. 
You cannot interpret it differently, but you stay with the word, for God's word is not a private interpretation, but by the Holy Spirit bringing the word to pass. So Cush now, named Hermes, called Bel, also named Janus, yes, he actually was the originator and father of this polytheistic system, which Nimrod took up and expanded it. For it was only one place in the earth. But Nimrod, through war, and through going to the various nations, was able to expand it. Yes, clearly, friends, we see here this confounder of the nations, this one who destroyed the people by his strategies of warfare that he used. Now, Janus, one of his names, means two-faced. So he is the two-faced God. And that's what Satan is. Religious on one side, and the devil and ungodly on the other side. And you'll find that in his children also. Very hypocritical, because on one hand, uh, act like a Christian, move like a Christian, then go out, amen, like I say to my people, singing the songs in the church, reading out of the Bible, praising God on a Sunday, and then go out and live like a devil on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Come back again to be like a Christian, be like an angel on the Sunday, and go back to being a devil on the Monday. My God, have mercy. But that is what we face in our world today. So this two-faced Janus, this Hermes, this thief and liar, this one who loves warfare, and thank God we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickednesses in high places. My God, thank God forevermore. Amen. So here we find out that it is said that he constantly rebelled against the one true God. Now, believing in one God is called monotheism. Monotheism. M-O-N-O-T-H-E-I-S-M. Which is completely opposite to polytheism. Right. So he was rebelling against one God and the doctrine and teaching of one God. So this worship of many gods, we find out where it came from. It came from Cush, Nimrod's father, was in Babel, which Nimrod came later and turned into a magnificent city called Babylon, and went out from, the, which was the beginning of his kingdom, went out from there with his arts of war, which he learned the techniques and strategies from his hunting days of hunting animals, and turned his hunting abilities to hunting men and killing men. And therefore, he conquered everywhere that he went. And by starting that religion of the worship of many gods, then he became known as father of the gods because he started that religion. So he is the father or elder or ancestor of that particular religion of polytheism. Now, there we find out, friends, from there came ancestor worship because they began to worship him. From there came the communion of saints because they worshiped their ancestors even after they're dead. Of course, we know in our Bible for you to speak to the dead or pray to the dead, the Bible calls it necromancy. It's witchcraft. 
It's called necromancy. And the biggest witchcraft operation we have today is praying to the so-called saints, which are dead. And we are not to pray to the dead. Somebody says, oh, well, Brother Simon, Jesus died. How come you pray to him? Well, he said, I am he that was dead, but behold, I am alive forevermore. So he is not dead. He lives forevermore. It's as much as saying you can kill God. You can't. God is not dead. Jesus Christ is not dead. And God can't die. It's impossible. So we pray to him who the eternal one and bless his holy name. Every other man, you will read it in the Bible. And he, you, he lived for so many hundred years and he died. So and so was great in the land and he did this, this, this. There's a history about and he died. And you will read that throughout the Bible. Come into human history, you'll read the same thing. And he died. And over and over again, he was a great warrior. He was a great general. He was a great king. And he did this and he accomplished that. And he died. But of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, they killed him at Calvary. But behold, he rose from the dead and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he also live. Oh, praise God. I'm so glad we serve a mighty God, an ever-living God, an eternal God. To him be all the praise, the honor, and the glory. It was Cush who first introduced the belief in three gods. A triune God, or a God in unity. Three gods in unity, each equal to one another. So they called it homosuis of the same substance, together the one God. Now that's what they he introduced, and he taught that a Father, Son, and Spirit. He taught it in the form of Father, Son, and Spirit. Of course, now we have it as uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But back then, when he started it, it was Father, Son, and Spirit. Right. And then he also knew about the seed of the woman promised by God in Genesis chapter 3. I believe verse 18. And so something had to come out of that. He had to have a representation and a picture of that. Well, it came to pass that Nimrod, with all his so-called greatness, died. And his wife, as we said before, was Semiramis. And Semiramis made herself mother of the son, mother of Cush's son. That is her claim. Of course, she was married to that son, but now she says she is the mother of that son. That means she became and elevated herself to the position of mother of the gods because Cush, who was the father of the gods, was now dead, Nimrod, the son of the gods, was now dead, and now here she comes, mother of the gods. Exactly as we see churches today are propounding and defying Mary and claiming that Mary was without sin and that Mary is the mother of God and claiming that she is the one that was actually uh, caught up into the heavens supernaturally. And therefore, we look back and see the contrast with the Bible and see how the doctrine of the holy assumption of Mary being assumed into heavens. 
It didn't come from the Bible. It came from Babylon. It came from the ancient past. Thousands of years ago in the darkness of idolatry and paganism. Here comes this evil doctrine now accepted in the modern times. Paganism has intertwined itself into Christianity until Christianity is now bastardized and it's being infiltrated and polluted by the sins of man and sins rooted in the idolatries of the past. Of course, soon they have her as the one trampling on the serpent's head. And the Bible says he, the Messiah, will trample on the serpent's head. But if you were to go search in a lot of the history books and look at the pictorials, different places, you will find they have Mary stamping on the serpent's head. Contrary to the word of God, but in agreement with Babylonian history and depiction. They called her Queen of Heaven, Semiramis was called Queen of Heaven. Today, they have Mary. She is called Queen of Heaven. They made Semiramis divine. Today, they're preaching, talking, that Mary is divine. And are so blasphemous to say that she is the mother of God. She is not the mother of God. How could God have a mother? The eternal being, the eternal one. Amen. God has no mother. No, sir. We will not discuss that now, but that is contrary to the word of God. Amen. Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, the body that God used to express himself, they have now elevated uh, Mary. And they said, Mary has immortality. In other words, she has eternal life. Just like Jesus or God, God has. They made her immortal. And she, I think it was September 1964, they were discussing that to confer. Think about it. Man is going to confer on other humans immortality. Oh, just think about that, <clears throat> my friends. Then they call her Mary the Mediatrix. The Mediatrix. Now, we know the Bible tells us there is only one God and one mediator between God and man, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mary, the mother, so-called, of all believers. And now she is also called Mary, the mother of the church. If there was ever a, such a thing as Babylonian ancestor worship going on in religion, it is right now in the religion that issues forth from Rome. Not only was ancestor worship originated in Babylon, <clears throat> but so also was the worship of nature, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, Father Nature. Uh, you know, uh, they began to worship nature. And people began to worship trees and animals and different things of that nature. And many gods, the sun, the sun, the moon, were identified later on as gods, worship by Egyptians and other cultures, begin to worship them. And so here it was, friends. When the sun began to be worshipped, and the Egyptian called the sun Ra, and then we find he was called Baal. According to ancient history, the sun god was Baal, right? You will read of him in the Bibles, in your scriptures, and you'll read it there. And there it is, friends. 
And finally, Satan's heart's desire was fulfilled to be worshipped as a light giver, which in his light is not the true light, but the light he gives is darkness in the hearts of men. When he seduced the whole world, like he seduced Eve, now he's using those same lies and rumors and darkness to seduce the entire earth in which we live. Now how did Pergamos become the seat of Babylon? The seat of Satan. Now Babylon fell after a while. Militaristically, it fell. And when it fell at that time, they had a, the new king was Atullus. Atullus. And he was the Pontifex Maximus, which means to say priest, king, or king and priest. Pontifex Maximus. And Atullus, who was the king of Babylon, the Pontifex Maximus of Babylon, or shall we say the priest king of Babylon, he fled to the borders of Rome and fled with his pagan priests and with all their writings and so-called sacred mysteries and set up his kingdom just outside of the Roman Empire and thrived under the care of the devil right there. My friends, in conclusion, we found out the origins of satanic worship. We have discovered who, how Cushion Nimrod introduced the various idolatry, the arts of war, the strategies, the drilling, how to set up an army. It was Nimrod that first did it according to the Bible. We found also the origins of polytheism and science and invention. For the Bible tells us about the inventors of evil things. The origins of polytheism or the Trinity doctrine. We also found the origins of ancestor worship. Today it's called communion of saints, dead saints. Now think of it. You should not pray to the dead. We should not talk to the dead. Oh, well, that's uh, for them to bring up different things in the Bible. That's another matter of discussion. But Jesus is alive. Thanks be to God. Amen. They introduce meditative worship on the earth. All these religions with meditative type of, of worship on the earth. They introduce the worship of Mother Earth and the worship of nature. They also most importantly introduce woman worship. The worship of women. And this is what Satan did by placing Semiramis, who later is now called Mary. They are equating her to Mary and worshiping Semiramis under the guise of worshiping Mary, who is not to be worshipped. Only Jesus Christ is to be worshipped. For if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. There's only one God, and beside me there is no other. The only one God to be glorified and magnified. But they introduce, or they're putting in the minds of men by, and, and women or people by worshiping Mary. Subconsciously, people are made to worship women or to worship a woman and come to that place where they can now place her in a position of rulership and dominance 
like that uh, in that way. Also, we learned how the worship of the red dragon, the worship of serpents, as we saw in the temple in Pergamos, that they literally were worshiping a living serpent in Pergamos. This is a lot of history here, but I hope that you have noted these things and that they have laid in your heart some foundations that we might understand the rest of the church ages and the times in which we live that we will be able to understand it better and some of the things around us. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for receiving into your heart the word of God for this day and for this hour. We will be back next week to continue our study in the church ages, trusting that God will bless us together as one in Jesus Christ. And may God bring us to a place where we will begin to study how God denounced Pergamos and the unbelief that was in Pergamos where Satan's seat was. God bless you real good. And let us come once again next Wednesday around the Word of God to continue our study of the seven church ages. God bless every one of us, one and all, everywhere that we are. God bless you. Take care.